Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Harebrained Games. Today we're going to take a look at a game called Undaunted Normandy. Undaunted Normandy is a two-player game pitting the Allied forces against the German forces in various scenarios related to and around Normandy invasion of 1944. Uh, it's run by David Johnson and Trevor Benjamin. It is designed to be a light tactical strategy game with a few twists and turns. And that's about all I need to say before we get in and take a look. Okay, let's take a look at what comes in every nutritious box of Undaunted Normandy. You have map tiles. Now I have here all but two of the tiles laid out for Scenario 3. Warning and caveat, I will be going over Scenario 3 um, in this. And so if you don't want spoilers, you might skip ahead to my final comments. But here we have a layout of... Uh, the uh, typical start scenario for the two sides playing Undaunted Normandy. You can see the details. These are double-sided tiles. They're arranged as per every scenario. And uh, so they do provide a tremendous amount of, of uh, variety for how your battlefield is going to look. Terrain-wise, each, each piece of terrain has only one really significant feature, besides just the numbering for knowing where to put what, when, where as far as how to arrange them, but this is the number that matters. This is the defense value, the cover value of that tile. That's it. Uh, one thing's about Undaunted is that it is simplified to a great degree such that you don't have to worry about, you know, traversable navigation or fields or forest. The actual terrain itself is not is not relevant. It's indicative of perhaps the cover level, but it's not something where you're going to have to be wondering how to maneuver to the bridge and going across. Remove that, strip that away for simplification purposes, and this will be the cover value. Here you'll notice that cover in these woods is good. You'll notice there's almost a sort of a killing fields here of no cover, not good, and then up into the valleys again. Each side has their set of cars. We have the the uh, hands, the it, in each scenario, it will tell you what cards go into your deck, what cards you're allowed to have in your supply. In this case, we have this uh, four cards for this player, the deck, which is the rest of it, and then these can be obtained over the course of the game to reinforce your deck, um, putting them into your discard pile so that they will cycle through to become part of your deck. These are This is basically sort of your health points, your life points, your in, in, in a, to put it in crude terms, but ultimately you... Once these run out, once you've run out, you've run out. So, for example, if you run out of machine gunner cards because they have been eroded from taking casualties in battle, you don't have them anymore. Uh, so that'll, that'll make more sense once you go through the playthrough. The other thing of significance are the tokens. Not very many of them, not very many needed. You have these victory point tokens or control... the Yeah, yeah victory point tokens here. As you control... As an army, when your riflemen come in and take control of these areas, you will gain those victory points. Once you have accumulated the proper amount of victory points for a scenario, you will win automatically. Uh, every, scenarios do differ. There are some other objective criteria, but in a lot of the scenarios, it will come down to controlling the map's pivotal victory point areas. For example, in this case, you will have, if you control, I believe, three, four, five, six... I believe it's six or seven, I'll look it up, uh, points, then then you will win. The other thing is these markers here. There's, um, there's scout and then control. One of the interesting things about this game is that your scouts are pivotal. You have scouts, you have riflemen, you have machine gunners, you also have snipers and mortars in some of the other scenarios, but we won't be going into those right now. And these scouts, you'll notice some of this is, these tiles are scouted. Riflemen, and for the, for the most part, your units, with rare exception, cannot move into an area that is not scouted. How do they scout? Scouts will move during their turn using a scout action, and then they, they will place a scout token, like so. I'll just use this for now. And that's and that's really what they do. There's a cost to that we'll also go into. But uh, so as your scouts are moving around, as your riflemen move in, one of the actions they can take that they're capable of is control. And if you do not have any other enemy units, you can control it. Therefore, you control it. Now, why, normally you would only care about that for victory points. But that's generally what you're going to use. And then the dice, of course, are for rolling to see if you actually 
hit your unit. So roll, roll when you're attacking something, you roll, and if your die roll is greater than the cover uh, bonuses and such, then it's a hit. Uh, and the opponent player will have to remove from the game a card that matches that unit's type. So that's how you deplete your forces. That's it. That's basically all there is to it. I think it takes longer to explain it than it did to simply show you. And now we're going to get into a turn, which you're going to find is also generally pretty easy to grok. All right, let us do a playthrough of Scenario 3. Scenario 3 represents what's called the raid across the canal. I'm actually going to read you the text that explains it. On 18th of, no, on 16th of June, the 30th Infantry Division finished clearing the area north of the Viratois Canal. That night, and yes, I probably did utterly mispronounce that, that night they dug in along the gentle slope leading down to the bare and watery no man's land along the canal. The Germans mounted a counterattack that evening, making a raid across the canal. It was driven back by massed infantry fire. So that's really where we start out. Six victory points is needed in order to win this scenario. Which makes it interesting, because the Germans can literally just go into these four spots and get all that they need. So it's not okay for the Americans to rest on their heels. They've already got two victory points here, four and there. So neither side is really going to be able to just sit back and and sort of turtle in their ways. Now how do we begin? We always begin the same way. Everybody draws four cards from their deck, and no, you're not usually going to show your hand. Then we determine initiative. Americans start with the initiative, but we're going to see if they keep the initiative. The initiative lets you go first, which is pretty valuable in that it can take, it can basically, um, you know, mess with your opponent before your opponent can mess with you, etc. Most of the time, it's incredibly advantageous. In this case, I have the Platoon Sergeant, which is a powerful card. It lets me muster any units, not just units, not just, I mean, from anywhere. So I could literally put any card from my supply into my deck. Very powerful dude. But he also has a high initiative, so if I really want to go first, I would have to sacrifice his powerful benefits in order to do so. I have a Scout... And Scout is powerful, but I have Fog of War cards, and these just clog up the deck. Yeah, you start with them, and your enemies can throw them into your deck, but they're just cloggers. I don't really care who goes first right now, so I'm just going to pretend that I'm going to use that. That's going to be the card I submit for initiative. Over here, we don't have Fog of War, so we are going to have to take one and do it. We also have the Platoon Sergeant, which is nice. We have the Squad Leader for Unit A, and a Rifleman for Unit A. Now we could bolstering. Bolstering is like reinforcing. I, I, in my mind, I just think reinforcements have arrived. You bolster by being able to say, grab cards from your supply and put them into your discard pile. Uh, inspire means you can take a card that you've already played and pick it back up and reuse it again. Like, hey, go forth, sally forth and conquer. You can do it. You belong. Then, um, of course, the riflemen have their general move, attack, or control. Uh, they're the sort of the basic, basic units. I'm going to go ahead and try the, the rifleman here. All right, so then once that's done, you reveal, and whoever is tied, whoever has the most powerful unit is the one that goes first. But these cards are discarded, so you do you lose them for use. In the case of a tie, of course, the, I believe the initiative remains where it's at. So, initiative token goes here, and now we get to play our cards. Now, looking at it, we have choices. We're far away from firing, so we do we want to go do a mad grab? We don't have any, any way to move anywhere we don't already have a scout token because we have no scouts to help us on the way. So, I think we should... I'm going to move... This may or may not be... So, eh. You know what? We're going to bolster. We can take any three cards and put them into our, into our pile. So we're going to... All right. Let's do it. We're going all guns. You know, our disc, that's, these are going to come out, and as soon as I play that card, if I don't have my token on the board, it goes into the reinforcement spot, which is here, and then we're rolling, and then do our move. So, uh, we're basically putting all our guns, we're, we're, yeah, we have ideas. We have ideas. So, we have done that. Normally, you would play the card, keep these in your hand. Then, we're going to play Rifleman. Rifleman says I can move one, attack one, or control. I'm way too far away to, to attack, but I'm going to go ahead and take a risk, and I'm going to move, sorry, this belonged over here, into here. Look at that. I've already scouted that area, so I'm there. Now, 
I have used it. Now I can use my squad leader, my final card. I can either add two units. Now for squad leaders, you can only bolster units from their squad. So squad leader A, the only options you have are rifleman or scout. So you can't uh, bolster from other squads. Whereas the platoon sergeant is the overarching commander and can basically tell anyone what to do at any time because he's a stud. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and inspire, move that card back into our hand, and then play it again. Now I could fire right now at those units, or I could use the control action to control it, which I'm going to do. Whether that's wise or not, doesn't matter. We're doing this for explanatory purposes only. So now we have a victory point one-sixth of the way there. And that's it for our Germans. Now we go over to the... The other side, Fog of Wars are worthless, and these go into the discard pile. Bye-bye. See ya. See ya real soon. All right, so now we have our options. Fog of War is just, it doesn't do anything, so never mind that. Again, platoon or scout. Now, our scout can do mighty things. We don't want to leave it too far in the open, but we would like to do... So we're going to use our scout. Scout says he can move up to... I mean, scouts can move up to two spaces, and everywhere they move, they leave behind a, a patrol point, a patrol token, uh, which has, like I said, pluses and minuses. Conceal, on the other hand, means make your enemy take a Fog of War card and put it in their discard pile. Uh, recon means you can get rid of a Fog of War card, and when you do, you get to draw a card. So that's how you thin out those Fog of War cards. Um, we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to go ahead and move our scout one, just one, we're not going to move all two, and then, guess what, we have now scouted a potential target-rich victory point place, but we have to take a Fog of War card and put it in our discard pile when we do, so our scouting reveals many mysteries, but it also clouds many mysteries as well, and then you'll have to use your scout later to get rid of the Fog of War, so there's a benefit and a detriment to your scouting opportunities. And then finally, we have that, which means we can command... Command is special in that you can I can draw cards if I wanted to and play them right on this turn, but I'm not going to. I'm going to instead uh, take the opportunity to grab a Rifleman and a Scout and a Rifleman. And there we go. And that's it. And they go into the discard pile. La-di-da. And that is the end of the round. All right. So now that everyone's done, we're going to go ahead and do this again. We grab four more cards. One, two, three, four. We'll only play the second round, but because I don't want to bore you all, it's right before dinner. All right, so now we're looking at more options, more options. So in this case, we're going to go blah, blah, blah. I did heavy thinking. Um, we'll, darn it, we'll put the squad leader there and have him be the... And then here, we'll decide uh, the A Scout, the B Scout. Uh, we'll just do our Scout. So if we were to do this, it'd be, oh, look, the Americans get the initiative. How'd that work out? So there we go. Now, uh, the Americans get to go first. So what are they going to do? Well, they have Rifleman, uh, ri Rifleman, Rifleman, and Squad Leader. So we're going to go ahead and try firing just for fun. Uh, at this at this particular place. So Rifleman, you will attack. Rawhide! Alright, so he's going to attack one. Now you can attack anywhere, but it's just usually not a good idea the farther away you are from. Attack one means one dice. To determine what dice number you need to hit, you take the intrinsic value, defense value, four, add it to the terrain value, zero, and then add one for each distance away. So four, five, six, seven. So I need to get, I need to get seven. Yes, I do. Ha! Seven. All right. So we have successfully attacked the Rifleman A. Now we don't have to worry. Uh, the, the token stays there. And what happens is we take damage. Now we take damage in a certain order. First off, we, uh, the damage that we take is Determined, in, yeah, it's definitely determined first by your hand, then your discard pile, then your deck. Um, and that's what you got to do. So, you have, 
We don't we don't have a rifleman's uh, a rifleman card here. So then we go through our discard pile, and we go oh. There we go, Rifleman. And that's out of the game. We don't get that back. Now we have less cards with which to use our Rifleman. Plus, if we run out of those cards, then that becomes a casualty. And we don't get to use them at all. We pretty much pinned them down and they're worthless to, to us. So there we go. So we've taken damage. Then we can do, let's do it again, Rifleman. Same thing. We have Rifleman A and he can fire. So he's going to go one, two, so four, five, six, seven eight bang so nasty all right so then oh rifleman no and then the deck oh so now we're in a situation where we've gone through all here we don't have the appropriate card and therefore bye bye rifleman out you go so now it becomes interesting because if you right now there is no way that that rifleman would have been actually yes that's right there wasn't any cards so it went off the board. Hopefully I played that right. Someone will tell me if otherwise. Uh, but the only way to get your Rifleman A squad back now is to, um, is to, is to bolster. And so definitely got to be careful on that one. Uh, but they're out of the running and they're, I mean, it's, yeah. So that's what happened there. That was pretty devastating. And finally the squad leader we can use to inspire, which means we can go back and we can fire again. But I really don't want to... Yeah, bolster. Yeah, what, what the heck? So we're gonna we're gonna uh, inspire the only thing we can inspire, which is the rifleman. We'll put him back in our hand, take him back out, play it again. We're gonna go here, and this is eight now because it's one farther. So we're gonna go after. Actually, yeah, we're gonna go after the rifleman with their with their four, and then five, six. Oh wait, four, five, six, seven. So same seven. Two, so that's a miss, which is a lot more common than what what I'm showing here. There's a lot of misses in this game. It's definitely a battle of fatigue and attrition. Now we're down to the German side, and they're kind of it'll. They have options. The fog of war is useless. Uh, I don't like that. The squad leader, the scout. So the scout's going to go. You know what? I really need to thin my deck. I think I'm in an okay place right now, so I'm going to go ahead and and uh, recon. Um, which is to get rid of this out of the game entirely and draw a card. Of course, it's another Fog of War, but okay, there you go. So that's that. And then Squad Leader could let me do that again. Um, or I could Scout, uh, which probably it will do. So he would say move here. And here, why would he do that? Well, and then add a Fog of War to the discard pile. Uh, because that way it allows the rifleman to move in here where there's a lot more coverage. And hopefully when the machine gunner comes online can maybe even move over here or here and then be able to start uh, suppressing. Suppressing is interesting. It's something only machine gunners are able to do where they don't knock out units, but they will flip a unit over if they are suppressed. And then when they're activated again, all they can do is flip back. So it's a delaying action as suppression usually is. This is just a small example. There's a lot of other things in here in the game that kind of show what's going on but that's generally the point you are fighting over control you are moving you are scouting you're moving your rifleman in where your scouts scouted you're using machine guns to try to like hold off the enemy units once it gets close you'll know it's interesting i mean if you're no matter what you're always going to have some sort of dice for like in this example if either one of these attacked either one the dice value would be five i believe six uh so you're not you're not going to get freebies on this one it's it definitely is a grueling march to try to accomplish what you want to whittle down the enemy forces and to win that's it so let's get to my final thoughts on undaunted normandy Okay, let's talk about Undaunted Normandy. What did I think? Okay, let's go over the cons first, as always. This is the second game in a row that I played, oddly enough. Uh, the first one being Unicornus Knights. When you can hamstring yourself by your very decisions into a untenable situation. So no safety net on this one. That's not a con, just a warning. You can, uh, you can if, you're, if you're not careful, you can deplete your own, uh, your own units by mismanaging your card play. There's not a lot of differentiation between sides, and so playing the Germans, playing the uh, Americans, you're going to find like almost identical troop, if not identical uh, troops. 
but the scenarios will change that up so that you'll have you'll have a, a different configuration of the same unit so uh, that's the similarity is what it is uh, you know chess has similar pieces for each opponent as well um, it's not historical or even close to this is one of the things that that I was uh, initially misunderstanding which is that I thought that Undaunted Normandy because it was using names on cards for for units and stuff they aren't really names they're kind of meant to be indicative of the fact that you're you should be getting attached to your units a little bit and these should be your people you're trying to protect uh it, it was a misunderstanding on my part um it's you know it's it's not like there's not a lot of granularity or precision to these to these scenarios so you're not going to recreate the actual minutia of of the various conflicts that occurred um you know, in that regard, my core expectation failed where I thought it, it, it did. My bad. The the battles are, you know, more inspired by true events, which is to say sort of, uh, than they are really indicative of these events. Bolster was a confusing term for people. I wish it just, I just told them to start thinking of them as reinforcements. Like, when you bolster, you reinforce. I get it, but man, that term was a little bit of an outlier compared, you know, when playing it with others. Um... The thing is, this is not a Diablo and Me Memoir 44 edition. Uh, you machine gun, you know, you're not going to have a machine gun that's going to slice its way across a swath of enemies, die rolls that are going to, you know, knock out three of four units, and yeah, and there's some sort of semi deitist guerrilla mode. The hits here are very precious, and every opportunity to eke better odds must be taken. No one-shot kill arcade mode in this game. And if that's more to your liking, then you may find yourself exasperated by the damage dealing aspect of this game, where you are really just attrition you're just wearing down card by card your enemies um so being keep being mindful of that if you're going to play this game that it is not uh memoir 44 meets diablo now let's get to the pros this game surprisingly it, it simulates every aspect of squad level battle in an elegantly simplified in some ways rather surprising way there's this excellent exig exigent Excellent, elegant uh, simplification that migrates one's focus from these encyclopedic rules checking modes uh, and uh, in, in rule reference lookups into this more fluid, tense, story transpiring um, phase with minimal rules to remember. That is... That's great because it nails the actual feel of a close quarters, or at least for me, man-to-man -man battle or squad-to-squad -squad battle. Um, one mission, the starter mission, in fact, was so back and forth and uh, exhausting reinforcements. I was one turn away from winning. The tide turns. I fought back. I mean, these are the moments you want in a game uh, to, you know, as opposed to like checking the charts for the sub charts for the sub table to roll the dice to check the rolling column to find out what happened. There's really not a lot of that here. Not that I don't mind that as well, but for this, it, you know, I did like the feeling of, of constant activity. This is the um, second game in a row where deck balancing, you know, not the general drafting is in full view. Uh, in, in other words, you know, you have your cards and it's up to you to decide when to bring in reinforcements, but you're, you're also diluting uh, the ability to maybe get extra extra moves for the existing reinforcements. So the more you're putting cards in your hand, the more scattered your options are going to be, and the more at the mercy of randomization. Whereas if you specialize in like I'm only I'm not going to bolster it be, because then I can have more turns with the units I've got out there, which gives me more options, more chances to attack. It's a really interesting way of doing it that doesn't require a lot of extra overhead rules. Um, you know, it's not it's not that you're actively looking for killer combos, but it can happen, and it's mighty when it does. The other thing is there's strings of momentum, both good and bad. Uh, you, I mean, you're going to have cards in your hand that are that are just not going to be what you want, and you're going to have some dead turns or some you know a few turns not necessarily dead, although if you have enough fog of war cards, it could be, but turns where you're just not going to get much impact, while as your opponent could have the meat of his lineup, um, <laughs> you know, in this, you know, the, in, in, being in, in blazing away, and I think that's why, or I hope that's why, and maybe it is why, but I think that addresses the low hit rate of your forces, because if you could just wipe out a unit in one turn, then that's going to make the scarcity, that's going to make those, those lulls in your deck, 
um, much, much more pronounced. Whereas, you know, even if you have a couple low turns, what you're trying to do is, is you know, just eke, eke your way through until you until you can kind of make a comeback or you know, there's all kinds of ways to try and bolster whatever but you need a little bit of time and i think the the low hit rate or the fact that it's really hard to hit your enemy units it's not a given it's not roll four you know four better on a 10-sided die um you know even if you're in the same in in this exact same tile you still have opportunities to miss there's a lot of missing and i think those two points kind of balance each other out so that that make it for a stressful and yes it can be exhausting when you roll dice 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 you get you get a nice you know hand and you just like miss 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 ah oh. But then, you know, if you have machine guns, bring them in. Try and try and uh, suppress for a while. Hold off. All of these strategic ideas form in your head without ever needing to read a 20-page rule book in order to do those. The price point is perfect. At $25, I bought two copies um, because I needed one for, for nostalgia and to give to people that I liked. Um, but at twenty five bucks, you're gonna you get a serious bang for your buck here. Uh, the campaign I think is just right. The missions are succinct and and reasonably different enough that um, I, I find stringing them together makes for a nice fluid campaign. There's no real persistence between uh, you know the missions, so it's it's not necessarily a campaign. But you just play the scenarios in order to get sort of the historical understanding of what they're trying to in some ways abstractly represent for the battles that occurred in Normandy, uh, you know, past the beaches in 1944. So it's definitely a game bent towards lighter fare gaming, and so it, it doesn't need necessarily, like, persistence or a lot of things. So in summary, for Undaunted Normandy, hmm. you know, when I first saw the box and the stylized art and the marketing blurbs and what appeared to be real names... On each of the units, I thought for sure that this was the one game that I have been looking for. A game that took real people and then put those real people into a game with attributes and skills matching their real world experience. And then going through that campaign with those real people, at least I thought, in semi-real missions in the very same situations they encountered. And I still remain hopeful that someday we'll see some, some, some games in that vein. I would form probably a greater bond with a real person's exploits than an, an imaginary ones. Um, there are plenty of games that showcase real situations uh, or in real battles, but to fuse the real people in, that would be a sight for me to see. Um, every once in a while, though, a game comes along that doesn't meet your expectations or your initial expectations, and Undaunted Normandy did not meet those expectations because they were inaccurate expectations. Even rarer is a game that comes along that doesn't meet those expectations, and you're all the better for it. And that's also Undaunted Normandy. What no, no, Undaunted Normandy does is it infuses an approachable squad-level wargaming feeling into an ingeniously polished experience that's a breeze to teach, a breeze to play, and a breeze to enjoy. The more I play it, the more I want to play it. Uh, there are so many swings that felt like they were mortal blows but just gla you know, glanced off and weren't, or that were sure to snatch a victory only to be diverted one turn too many um, is this Fields of Fire for Mortals? Uh, it, it's, you know, Fields of Fire, if you don't know, is one of the most complex squad-level games I've ever encountered, uh, you know, dealing with cards. Um, this is a glorious simplification of the essence of a, of a Fields of Fire game. It's, it's Tolstoy if he'd written pop-up books. Um, I love it for what it is, and I'm glad that it isn't what I thought it was. Uh, I really think that Undaunted Normandy is an excellent introduction to and you know for and even you know for veterans and you know new ones alike that want to just kind of experience the feel of battle, the 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 reality that life wasn't a Diablo you know machine gun mowing uh, effort that you do have to you know make your choices make smart choices but at a higher level like Civilization for example if you played Civil Civ games you don't you get a lot of information to make choices but you make the interesting choices. You don't have to get down into the, you know, calculating uh, popularity, culture, uh, trade routes, and all that, unless you want to. And this is the same way. You take that top-level choices, the choices that are interesting, and you make them. And it's great. It's great two-player, not so great. I played it solo player just to kind of mess around, but you really need that sort of initiative to be two players at this point. So, highly recommended. Undaunted Normandy. Give it a shot if you get some time. It's cheap, affordable, and awesome. So take care, and we'll see you next time on Hairbrain Games.